Hey everybody, sorry to have this up late. Facebook Live wasn't working for some reason, but that's okay. We're on YouTube now, we'll make it work one way or the other. Um, tonight's devotion is going to take a little bit of a more serious tone, though. I feel like with the death of George Floyd, our whole country is kind of just reawakening to the injustices in our system. Um, the racism, the classism, all the ways certain people are kept away from power, are put at risk of violence. Um, I think we're just all trying to figure out how have I contributed to this individually and corporately, and what can I do? What can I do to change something? Um, tonight's scripture, I think, has a really good message to think on as we wrestle through that. This is from the book of Habakkuk, and if you're not familiar with Habakkuk, that's all right. Uh, it's, it's one of the minor prophets, and that is 12 books in the Old Testament. That they're, they're pretty short. They aren't super common sermon topics, uh, but they're, they're the short 12 books, and all of them have the same theme, really, which is but just this cry for justice. Israel is unjust, and God, when will there be justice? And um, that's part of the reason why people like Martin Luther King Jr. kind of looked to these so carefully. You may remember uh, one of his speeches featured the let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Uh, that's a little piece from Amos, which is a different book. Uh, but tonight's Habakkuk, and Habakkuk's got some good stuff for us. Uh, I'll, I'll catch us up, because Habakkuk 2 is what we're looking at. Habakkuk 1 started out with Habakkuk saying, God, things in Israel are unjust. There are these people at the top that take advantage of others. They're violent. They hoard everything. They're, they're unjust. This is wrong. When are you going to fix it? And second, then, then God responds. He says, well... I have raised up the Babylonians, and they are strong, they are unbeatable, and they will punish Israel for what they've done. They're going to destroy Israel. And Habakkuk responds, well now hold on, um, feels like unjust people are in power now, and it sounds a lot like you're just going to send some more, even more powerful unjust people to punish them. How come these people always seem to prevail? What's going on? Why are they always at the top? Why are you letting this happen? And so now we move in chapter 2 to God's response to that. Then the Lord replied, Write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come. Will not delay. See, the enemy is puffed up. His desires are not upright, but the righteous person will live by his righteousness. Indeed, wine betrays the unrighteous. He is arrogant and never at rest, because he is as greedy as the grave, and like death, is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Will not all of them taunt him with ridicule and scorn, saying, Woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. How must, long must this go on? Will not your creditors suddenly arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? Then you will become their prey because you have plundered many nations. The people who are left will plunder you, for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities in every one of them. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain, setting his nest on high to escape the clutches of ruin. You have plotted the ruin of many people, shaming your own house and forfeiting your life. The stones of the wall will cry out. The beams of the woodwork will echo in. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire? that nations exhaust themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Woe to him 
who gives drink to his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they're drunk, so that he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. The cup from the Lord's right hand is coming around to you, and disgrace will cover your glory. The violence you've done to Lebanon will overwhelm you, and your destruction of animals will terrify you, for you have shed human blood. You have destroyed lands and cities and everyone in them. What value is an idol carved by a craftsman, or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it can trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, come to life, or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. Now, you can see there's kind of a structure to this. First off, we have the introduction, and then we have five woe oracles. I kind of counted them off for you as we were going. All the sections that start with woe to what, whatever. Um, and here in the beginning, you'll see... Um, I think the, the thing that interests me the most about the beginning is the villains are not who we assume them to be. I think in movies, you know, movies are super good about this. They make the villain so easy to spot. The villain is always just utterly maniacal. They're insanely evil, like, like killing their own people, and they hate babies, and they kick dogs, all that kind of nonsense. Uh, they're just evil for evil's sake. That's what they are. But here, God describes the unrighteous as someone that wine betrays him. He's arrogant and never at rest. Never at rest especially stands out to me. Um, resting is not something I normally associate with goodness, um, even though it's enshrined in the Ten Commandments. Go figure. But this is someone, he, he will not rest. He will not look inward. No! He's always looking outward. He wants, he sees, and he wants, and he's trying to control, to get his fingers into everything. That's who we're talking about because he's greedy as the grave. And like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers to himself all the nations and takes captive all the peoples. Now, with that person being laid out, this is the villain. This is what they look like. Um we get the five woes. The five woes. Uh, woe to him who piles up stolen goods and makes himself wealthy by extortion. It, this, clearly they're not talking about someone who picks pockets. This is someone who uses his, his, all of the systems at his disposal to gain a lot of money. We even move on at the end. He has plundered nations. This is someone who has piled up riches that could belong to others. There are people in need, and this person sits on a pile of wealth that was, through whatever means, taken from them. Then we move on. Woe to him who builds his house by unjust gain. Where We're seeing this wealth kind of entrench. We're seeing the person who started out with a lot of money, now he's He's built a house on unjust gain to keep him safe. He's built walls, and God warns him, the stones of the wall will cry out. The beams of the woodwork will echo it. Even your house will turn against you. People know, and you're not as safe as you think you are. Um, and even, I'm going to jump back up to the first one real quick, because one bit that stands out to me, um, it almost seems a little bit like karma, because this is someone who's done wrong. He's done wrong by so many people to get money. And God says, will not your creditors arise? Will they not wake up and make you tremble? You will become their prey because you have plundered others. Other, they will eventually plunder you. Just, just comes or what goes around comes around. But then, of course, we've got our second verse. They're entrenching. And then the third one, 
they are now someone that is at the heart of an institution that they have developed. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and establishes a town by injustice. Has not the Lord determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? Now there's much to be said about how so many of our societies are built on bloodshed, on strength, on the ability to enforce. But I think what's even more relatable and more concerning has not the Lord determined that the people's labor is only fuel for the fire, that the nations exhaust themselves for nothing? How many of us want to leave our mark on the world, want to walk away with something that we can say, that's there because of me. I made a difference. And here the Lord says, though, this, this attempt in leaving a legacy that's worldly and building something for ourselves, it's nothing. This is nothing, because all of this will pass away. What's really at stake is that the earth will be filled with the knowledge and glory of the Lord. That's the good that's coming. Not this vain remember me project, not the glory of us, but the glory of God that will fill the entire world. And since I think that one's easily to miss here, I think it's worth pointing out, um, I think this could be read as, you know, the people's labor is only fuel for the fire. You know, it doesn't matter what you do on earth. It, it, you don't have to take care of the earth. That's, that's way out of context to take it in that direction. It's not saying you don't have to take care of what God gave us. It's saying for people who are involved in the vain project of propping up their legacy with things here, that's nothing. That is nothing. It's God's glory that's going to make the difference, not yours. So just something that could easily be misread that I think that's worth pointing to. Um, the fourth one. This is the one that's maybe the weirdest of all of them. Woe to him who gives drink to her na his neighbors, pouring it from the wineskin till they're drunk, so he can gaze on their naked bodies. You will be filled with shame instead of glory. Now it's your turn. Drink and let your nakedness be exposed. Weird. Really weird. Uh, that's, it, it reminded me of Genesis 9. And if you remember this one, this is where Noah's sons see him naked. Well, one of them does. It's a weird story. But this is uh, Genesis 9, verse 20. Noah, a man of the soil, proceeded to build a vineyard. And he drank some of the wine, and he became drunk and lay uncovered inside his tent. Ham, the father of Canaan, saw his father naked and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it across their shoulders, and they walked in backwards and covered their father's naked body. Their faces were turned the other way so they would not see their father naked. Um, it, that even goes further with the whole focus of, on the meaning of nakedness, you can go as far back as Genesis. The first thing that Adam and Eve do when they eat the apple is they put on clothes because they're ashamed. Um, it's kind of a, a, just a lot linked to that nakedness. I mean, just le being vulnerable, being laid bare. People can see all of you, not just physically, but I think metaphorically. One of the reasons why Adam and Eve are so ashamed they have now eaten and they can see each other. They can see what they've become, so they put on something because they're ashamed of who they now are. Before, they had no reason to, but now, having eaten, having sinned, they see who they've become. They see themselves laid bare. Uh, again, with Noah, there's, there's the sense of vulnerability. His son sees him naked, and it is wrong because he, he's here he's, it, it appears that he's, making fun of his father in this vulnerable position. Meanwhile, the other brothers respect their father and try, try to cover him because that's not a good thing to do. You should not make someone vulnerable and then mock them. And here, we, we draw on those same kinds of images to get to this statement where the, the, the fourth woe oracle is you are the person. You are the person who gets people drunk 
and then looks at them laid bare. You make fun of them, you taunt them, you see them at their most vulnerable for nothing other than to humiliate them. That's what you're doing. And you think you're so great, but get ready, because now you will be ba laid bare. You will be made vulnerable, and everyone will see exactly what you are made of. It makes one wonder if we were really laid bare, if people could see the stuff that we were made of, what would they see? If they saw the core of me, what am I? Would I be afraid? Is this clearly the unjust person is? Should, should that terrify me? And then the final one, this is where the formula breaks a little bit. We see a break in the formula. Um, Instead of just beginning right with woe to, we hesitate. Of what value is an idol carved by craftsmen or an image that teaches lies? For the one who makes it trusts in his own creation. He makes idols that cannot speak. And this goes back to the last chapter. There was a portion where uh, Habakkuk says, well now, hold on, hold on. The Babylonians are like fishermen and everyone around them like, is like fish. And they just go out and they catch everybody. And at the end, what do they say a prayer to? Their net. Their net because they're just, that's the, their tool, their tool to destroy everyone. They rely on their own strength, their own tools. That's all they worship. And here God says, he's winding up for the final woe. And this is the indication that, oh, we're coming back around to this. People who worship themselves. What is that? It's idolatry. Woe to him who says, come to life or to lifeless stone, wake up. Can it give guidance? It's covered with gold and silver. There's no breath in it. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. And I love that end. The perfect juxtaposition for the unjust person. What is he? He is the person who is always living out here. He's the person who won't sit still. And when you're with God, you must be silent before him. You must be still. Um, and we also have as opposed to the people with idols who have to beg their idols to do things, and they won't because they're not real. God says, before me, you don't have to beg. Just be silent. Um, so that, that's what we have in this passage. At the end of the day, where it leaves us with, and it... it Societies that are built on injustice, these unjust people who take wealth, that, that go out and do wrong to people who don't honor other people, but instead shame them, humiliate them. People who build into the core of their societies these laws that protect themselves and hurt others. It's not just social things that they have wrong. It's that too. The first four cover social things, but the ultimate finale is that it's also a spiritual problem. These are people that worship idols. They worship themselves. They worship the tools that they use. They worship all the wrong things because they don't trust God. They don't know God. And as we wrestle, I, I think now is a good time to not just see this as a social crisis, but as a spiritual crisis, is we need to reevaluate what is, are, are we living lives that are genuinely faithful to God? Or have we become like the unjust person? Are we, as one of the richest nations in the world, are we people that have hoarded up wealth when people need it? Have we built societies that are unjust? Have we built ways to keep ourselves safe in the unjustness? Do we humiliate our, our brothers and sisters? And ultimately, have we abandoned God and become idol worshipers? It is a, a hard, hard pill to swallow, but I think that's, that's just the thing about following Jesus. It's not easy. And if we expect to live just lives, I think it involves intense scrutiny, continually looking at ourselves and asking, how can we do better? Um, we know our God is a forgiving God. But does that mean, as Paul would say, should we go on sinning? By no means. Um, 
Let's sit with the words of Habakkuk. Let them convict us and pray to God for forgiveness and for changed hearts. Amen.